let's take out our Bibles and learn together. One of the most important doctrines found in the Bible, and believe me, it's found there, is the virgin birth. If you are going to experience redemption, you need to affirm, that is, you need to believe that Messiah entered into this world through a virgin. Why is that so important? Because the virgin birth is inherently connected to his divinity. If someone denies the virgin birth, what they are denying is the divinity of Messiah. And if you deny the identity of Messiah as the Son of God, you haven't believed in a biblical Messiah. And if you haven't believed in the biblical Messiah, you are not saved. You have not experienced redemption. So the virgin birth is so vital. Well, what we're going to do in this study is that we're going to look at a few verses of Scripture that teaches us about the virgin birth so that we can understand it, believe it, and share this wonderful event with others. others because it's the virgin birth that affirms to us that God has visited his people that God himself took upon human flesh this humility of coming into this world dwelling among us as one of us in order that he and he alone could do the work of redemption now there's that famous prophecy from the book of Isaiah chapter 7 we'll come to that in a moment but before we do I want to begin with another promise and that promise is one of judgment in the scripture take out your Bible and look with me to the book of Jeremiah and chapter 22 now most people do not know that there is a most significant prophecy in this book it concerns a man, a man called Yehoiachin. Now, he had a brother with a similar name, but we're talking about one by the name of Yehoiachin. And when we look at the scriptures, whether we're talking about uh, Second Kings or Second Chronicles or here in Jeremiah, we learn that Yehoiachin was a wicked, faithless king. And therefore, there's a prophecy against him and this prophecy against him has some very important implications now look with me as i said to jeremiah chapter 22 for the sake of time i just want to read one verse the last verse of of chapter 22 realize the previous verse verse 29 speaks about how important it is to hear this hear it all the land of Israel because of its significance. But look at verse 30. It says, Thus said the Lord. Not says, as most Bible have, but it's thus said the Lord. Meaning it's a prophecy. It's in the future. But it has to do with something that we can believe it. It's as good as though it's already happened. That's why it's in the past. Thus said the Lord, write down this man, and we're speaking about Yehoiachin, write him down as childless. He is not going to have any child, notice what it says, a man who will not succeed in his days. For there will not be one who succeeds from his seed. Remember, he's going to be childless. There's not going to be one from his seed, meaning a natural born heir of his, that is going to sit upon the throne of David or rule anymore in Judah. Now, do you realize how devastating that is? That there's not going to be a child from him that is going to sit upon the throne of David. What's the implication of this? the messianic promise is destroyed there cannot be in the natural any messiah why Yehoiachin, an evil man but of that lineage of that house of david of that royal lineage 
and now we're told none of his children can sit upon the throne of David none of them are going to have success ruling over Judah this is disastrous it destroys the messianic hope but with God what did we learn with God all things are possible and therefore we're going to see that legally and what's important is how precise God's Word is now legally one is a descendant according to the lineage what does God do he uses that lineage but he's not a biological heir why because this one is conceived by the Holy Spirit this is what's important and it's only because Messiah was conceived through the Holy Spirit and again Messiah is the eternal Son of God there was never a time that Messiah did not exist we're not talking about the origin of Messiah he has no origin he's God he's eternal he was not created there's no time beginning with Messiah eternal what we're talking about is the incarnation how this eternal God entered into this world uniquely in human flesh for a purpose and that is to do the work of redemption and what we have here in Jeremiah 22 and verse 30 is a prophecy that says in the physical in the natural no natural born heir of this one is ever going to be king is ever going to have success upon the throne of David ruling over Judah well as I said God is able to do all things and how is he going to do that well now let's look at that scripture that I alluded to from Isaiah open up your Bibles now to Isaiah chapter 7 the book of Isaiah and chapter 7 it's so important that we see the context for understanding this passage of scripture Isaiah chapter 7 look with me if you would to a very important verse let's begin with verse 10 now God is speaking through Isaiah to who through a wicked king again Ahaz Ahaz and God wanted to to tell him I can do all things and in order for you to believe that I'll do all things he says you can ask for me for a sign you can make it in the heavens above or in the earth below anything and I'll do it to show that I am all powerful when you read here you find that Ahaz would not request a sign why he didn't want to know the eternal omnipotent God why he wasn't interested in serving God so he would not ask from a sign from God he says I will not now I'm dropping down to verse 12 Ahaz said I will not ask nor will I test the Lord well he's not testing God saying do this so I can reveal myself to you now look at verse 13 and he says listen please O house of David why house of David it's talking about the Davidic covenant that promise the house of David is a royal household a kingly household he says here basically there, there's nothing too small or too great he says here trust me in other words now go to verse 14 therefore the Lord he will give he himself to you for a sign very interesting how it literally says lachen yiten Adonai hu lachem ot therefore the Lord will give he meaning of himself unto you for a sign I would uh, circle that word sign it's the Hebrew word ot why an ot is a miraculous sign that God and God only can do he does it himself not with human assistance he does it beyond anything 
And this is the context for understanding the virgin birth. It is something that's miraculous that only God is able to do. Keep reading. Behold, ha alma. Now, this is a word which means a virgin, but as we'll see in a moment, a, a verified virgin. The virgin, she will conceive and will give birth to a son. And you shall call his name Emmanuel, with us God. This also speaks to the divinity of God, that name, with us God. The term with is a redemptive word. So we're speaking about God entering into humanity so that man and God can come together that they can be restored. Through what? Through redemption. But again, it's very important that you see that this is something miraculous that God is giving a sign. If it's just the term Alma it just means a young woman conceiving, well, that happens all the time. This is a special type of young woman. Now, I want us to see biblically that the term Alma is an attested virgin, one that's been certified. So what do we need to do? Go, if you would, to the book of Genesis, the book of Genesis and chapter 24, the book of Genesis and chapter 24. Now, the verse that I want you to see is verse 16 in this 24th chapter of Genesis. Here, Rivka, that is Rebecca, is being spoken of. Remember the situation. Eliezer has come to a distant land. He is looking for that wife for Isaac, that is for Yitzchak. And he wants God to act, to move in an unique event to reveal to him who this woman is and she's the one that when he says you know can I have a drink and she says uh, yes I'll give you a drink and I'll also water your cannibals notice what it says about her and the verse in question is verse 16 Genesis 24 verse 16 where it says and the young woman, this is word Nara, which just means a young girl. She is good in appearance, literally very good in appearance. And then notice this next word, Betula. Now, some will say that means virgin. Yes, it does mean virgin, but a virgin that is assumed. Why do I say that? Well, just look at what the scripture says. A virgin, and then we have the phrase. Ish lo yada'a, a man she did not know. So if the word virgin, bitula, means an absolute virgin, why do we need that phrase? Ish lo yada'a, that she did not know. Now what's interesting is when Eliezer goes and says to the family, recounts the same thing, he makes a change where is that well if you look at this same chapter but later on in this passage when he speaks and notice what the scripture says I'm speaking about verse 43 Genesis 24 verse verse 43 behold I was standing at the the well of water and came a Alma she went forth to draw and I said unto her draw please a little water from your jug so this is when Eliezer is reviewing saying what had happened how he came to that well and he saw Rivka first time that she's mentioned in the text she's so spoken of as a betula one who has never known a man but when we recount this story there's a change instead of the word betula it's the hebrew word alma which is a woman who has been attested as a virgin how do we know that well let's go to another passage of the scripture go if you would to the book of deuteronomy the book of deuteronomy and chapter 22 the book of deuteronomy and chapter 22, let's begin with verse 13. It says here, Deuteronomy 22, verse 13. 
It speaks about a man who has just gotten married, and it says, For a man will take a wife, and he will come into her. This is speaking about a, a sexual relationship. And what? He hates her. Why? Verse 14. And he sets upon her a shameful thing. He says that she's done shameful things. And he brings upon her an evil name and said, This woman that I have taken, I came near to her, speaking about this encounter, and I did not find her betulim, did not find her of a virgin. But it uses the term betulim, like we talked about betula. Now, what does this mean? Well, betula is one that's assumed to be a virgin. But notice what happens, verse 15. But her father, the father of this young woman, shall take, and his mother, and they shall bring out, notice what it says, betule hanara. These are the signs of her virginity before the elders of the city at the gate, verse 16. And the father should say of this young woman to the elders, My daughter I gave to this man for a wife, but he has hated her. Verse 17. And behold, he has placed a shameful deeds upon her name, saying, I have not found your daughter, Betulim. I have not found her to be a virgin. And these are what? These are the signs of her virginity. And he will spread out the cloth before the elders of the city. Now, what is this about? Well, a bitula is a woman who is assumed to be a virgin. But an alma is a woman who has been attested, certified, and there's a proof. Now, I'm not going to go into the details of that. You can research that for yourself. But there was a procedure done where a woman was verified that she was a virgin. And they had a garment, a cloth, that proved, and this was certified, that this is the fact that she's a virgin. So it's very important when it says in Isaiah chapter 7 that the virgin conceives. And gives birth this shows that it's a woman who is indeed a virgin verified certified and that's why we can be assured and believe in what the Word of God said and the reason why it's so important is this remember Jeremiah's prophecy Jeremiah's prophecy in chapter 22 and verse 30 is a natural descendant of Jehoiachim cannot be Messiah. He cannot sit upon the throne of David. So what does God do? God moves miraculously. He causes a man from that lineage. Who are we speaking about? We're speaking about Joseph. But Joseph, being of the king lineage, he did not provide of himself that male seed for Yeshua to be born for him to be conceived. What happens? He's engaged to Miriam, that is Mary. And because they are legally married, any children that come through his wife, his wife by marriage contract, they're his. They're of that same lineage, but that's in a legal way. Biologically, Joseph is not the father. Legally, he's the father. That makes Messiah Yeshua, Jesus Christ, a candidate for the Messiah, but he is not a physical descendant of Joseph. He is a legal descendant of Joseph, which means he's from the household of David, legally. That gives him the right to be the king. But biologically, we know that Miriam conceived not through human seed of Joseph, but by means of the Holy Spirit. Now, does anyone understand how that happened? No. It was miraculous. It was supernatural. The Holy Spirit, 
he came upon Miriam, that is Mary, and caused her to conceive. And the one that was within her is the Son of God, the eternal Son of God. This is what the scripture tells us about the birth of Messiah. And again, it is so vital that we accept that. It is only through the virgin birth that we can have a true Messiah, one that fulfills all the prophecy and one that that prophecy in Jeremiah chapter 22 and verse 30 also can be applied to. That's why a virgin had to conceive. That's why she had to be betrothed. By the way, legally, in Judaism, when you are betrothed, we would use the term engaged, you are legally married, and if you don't, don't want to be married, go through with it, you still have to provide a certificate of divorce why once one is betrayed betrothed we see that that relationship is established legally and all children now joseph it says in the scripture that he did take miriam to himself meaning he did go through with that second part of the wedding ceremony there's the betrothal and the taking under the chuppah he did that but he never knew her. She remained a virgin until after Yeshua was born. All of this is what the scripture attests to. Why? Because it was necessary to fulfill the word of God that Messiah be born of a virgin. And again, I said this at the beginning and we'll conclude with this. If someone denies the virgin birth, then that one, is denying the biblical identity for Messiah. And if you deny that he is the Son of God, you are not going to be saved. You have to understand that Messiah is both fully man and fully God, that you understand who he is. You can't accept one if you don't know him correctly. And that's why the virgin birth is so important. So must someone believe the virgin birth? Yes, this person should. And he must if he's going to know Messiah. If you reject the virgin birth, you are rejecting Yeshua. You are rejecting that gospel. You have not believed in the biblical Son of God. And what does the scripture say? Well, in, in 1 John, we read the scripture that, that I am writing to you that you might believe in the name of the son of god that term son of god is inherently related to his divinity and it's only when you are believing in the name yeshua jesus as the son of god then you will know that you have eternal life you reject the divinity of messiah you reject the virgin birth you reject the truth of the gospel so let me simply conclude by saying the virgin birth is essential, essential for salvation. Well, I'll close with that until our next study of the doctrines of Scripture. May God bless you.